Intercession, a continuous ministry. There is no doubt that the Silicon Convention, at one time, whatever it may be now, was one of the most wonderful gatherings of the Lord's children that ever took place, and Hyde had a great deal to do with the form it took. He was not conscious of this, but the atmosphere he brought with him seemed to affect the whole place. One felt a change coming over one as one entered the compound of the convention. It was a spirit of prayer, and when we entered into the prayer room, we understood the cause of the change of atmosphere. Perhaps I should explain what this prayer room really is. Mr. Hyde and a few others realized the necessity of preparation for the convention, and he felt that his work was to wait on God and plead for those who would attend. There are men in the Punjab who are especially endowed of the Spirit to organize such gatherings. Dr. Gordon, on whom in the old days the great burden of organizing all the departments of work fell, was so guided and helped by the Spirit that everything went like clockwork. To cater for 2,000 people is not an easy task, but the arrangements were so perfect that Dr. Gordon and all his willing assistants, including the missionary ladies that superintended the commissariat, were able to attend the services. I remember Dr. Gordon telling me that he really had nothing to do except to enjoy the convention. He spent much time in the prayer room, and one day he took me into his little tent and showed me his account books, beautifully written and everything noted down. The previous year's account had balanced to a piece, and all the work was carried on without any bustle or worry. Why do I mention these things in writing about praying Hyde? because prayer had so much to do with it. Hyde and his companions were in a room on the ground praying when Dr. Gordon and his companions were putting up the scores of tents, arranging the cooking apparatus, the supply of water, and the 101 little details necessary. Hyde felt and caused others to feel that it was necessary to prepare the messages and the tents and the food and the sleeping accommodations. And when others reached the ground to arrange the external necessities, he was on the ground to enter the prayer room, and for two days, two or three days and nights, Hyde and a few others were on their faces praying, pleading, praising, and claiming a blessing. Has the marquee been erected? Hyde and his party enter in at once to dedicate it to the Lord, and to make the spot a real Bethel, where God would meet with his people. Is the dining tent in position? The praying party must be there at once, so that the Spirit of God can use the meal times to bring blessing to his people. Sometimes the conversation in the dining tent destroys the effects of the messages giving in the preaching tent, but in Silica we never heard any gossip during meal times. Men and women formed parties, Indians and Europeans together, sitting at tables or in small groups on the floor, eating their meal, and feasting on the fellowship in the Lord. Were there any one in spiritual difficulties? Some brother or sister would say, let us go together to have a little food and talk over this great matter. And there, while eating, they realized that Jesus was with them. The meal was sanctified and it, by his presence, and everything appeared in a new light. Someone has found the Savior, and the Lord must be praised, and a hymn or a bhajan has started. And in an instant, the whole place is full of praise. The ladies giving out the food, the Christian waiters, as well as those who are eating, all unite in praising God. The Punjabis can sing, and the missionaries can sing, too. I was, it was in the dining tent I heard the glory song, sung in a way that I shall never forget, and I longed to go to glory there and then to begin this glory life. The food was left and got cold before we could eat it, but our hearts had been warmed up with the fire of his love burning within. Had Hyde's prayer anything to do with this? I do not know, but I do know that this is what he and his companions prayed for. The first day of the convention, and often on the previous night, the two prayer rooms were open, one for men and one for women, and prayer and praise went on continually until two or three days after the convention. It is immediately after the seed is sown that the birds come and devour the seed. Then comes the devil and takes away the word out of their hearts. Luke chapter 8, 12. McChain Patterson always says that the time for a very earnest, definite prayer is immediately after the service or a convention is over, and Hyde believed in this, so that when others remained on the ground after the convention was over,
to pull down the tent, etc. The prayer room parties remained to plead that the results of the convention might be permanent. If we had more prayer in the very place of our conferences and assemblies before they commenced during the sessions, and when they are over, how different the atmosphere would be. If we only realize that there is as much need for heart preparation as there is for comfort preparation. If we could feel that this is the absolute necessity, and for some to take this burden upon them, as Hyde did, what a blessing we would have. Can we not take this lesson to heart? Within the Veil Let us look at Hyde in the prayer room, say, in the Silica Convention. The prayer room is in a Scottish church. Some of the seats have been moved aside, and a carpet covers this open space. Sometimes there are hundreds of people there, at other times only two or three. Right on his face on the ground is praying Hyde. This was his favorite attitude for prayer. Listen, he is praying, he utters a petition, and then waits. In a little time he repeats it, and then waits. And this many times, until we all feel that the petition has penetrated into every fiber of our nature, and we feel assured that God has heard, and without a doubt he will answer. How well I remember him praying that we might open our mouth wide, that he might fill it. Psalm 81, verse 10. I think he repeated the word wide scores of times with long pauses between wide, Lord, wide, open wide, wide. How effectual it was to hear him address God. Oh, Father, Father. Even before he asked anything, I always felt that the Father knew what he was going to ask for him. When he finished his prayer, perhaps half a dozen are sobbing. Hyde goes to one of them, and others who are present go to the others. Hyde's arm is around the neck of the one that he is going to deal with. He speaks but little, but his well-worn Bible is used, and before long he stands up with a smile and the man with him, and he begins to sing, "'Tis done, the great transaction's done." And he is so full of joy that his whole body begins to move. He claps his hands, and then his feet begin to move, and look, he begins to dance for joy, and others join him until the whole place rings with God's praises. Sometimes he wants to be alone, and I heard of him climbing into the belfry. There in the dark, high above the others, he pours out his soul to God. Men hear the echo of his voice and realize that he must not be disturbed, for he is wrestling with God. What about his meals and his bed? The convention lasted for ten days in those early days, and his boy, a lad about sixteen that he had been, he had taken to his home in his heart, had brought Hyde's bedding and had carefully made his bed, but it was never used during the convention. I saw him more than once when the prayer room was full, go aside into one of the corners and throw himself on the floor to sleep. But if the room began to get empty and prayer to flag, he somehow seemed to know it and was up immediately and took his place with the other intercessors. Did he go to his meals? I think it was only once or twice that I saw him with us at table. Sometimes his boy, or Gulla, the sweeper, or one of his friends would take a plate of curry and rice or something else to him to the prayer room, and if convenient, he would go to a corner and eat it. How his boy used to cry because he would not eat properly and would not go to bed to sleep. Hyde was not the only one that did this. There were other missionaries who did the same, and Indian workers also, but it was Hyde's spirit and example that first of all led them into this prayer life. How often Hyde told me that he was afraid of following the example of men, and he dreaded lest anyone should try to follow his example, or McChain Patterson's example. And so I wish to close this chapter of reminiscences by begging of our readers to follow Hyde in his prayer life and prayer spirit but not necessarily in the form that he manifested it. There are thousands of God's children who cannot spend weeks in prayer and fasting as he did. They are not physically unfit for they are physically unfit for it, but everyone can have this prayer life making prayer their very breath. We need to be in the line of God's will in this as in every other duty. Hyde realized that in the case God demanded it of him. We all feel our need of more prayer and to be more persistent in prayer and intercession. Whether we spend a night or a month on our knees, realizing my own need, may I ask my fellow workers, Indians and Europeans, especially at this time, 
Shall we not give more of our time to prayer? Can we not have an occasional day of prayer and fasting? Let us go to the Lord and settle it with him. Let us be willing to sacrifice our own comforts in order to have more time for prayer. A living message from the Empowered Messenger. I wrote about Hyde at the conventions and promised to give one or two other incidents which I have observed at the conventions. He felt that his place was in the prayer room, but he had to enter the platform at times, and his messages were delivered with tremendous power, as we would naturally expect when he came straight from the prayer room to deliver his message. I shall never forget the effect of one of his Bible readings on the congregation and on the whole convention. He spoke in Urdu, and those who know Urdu say that he spoke the language well, if anything a little high-flown, using the book language more than a colloquial. I could not follow him, for my knowledge of Urdu is very meager, so I had an opportunity of watching him in the congregation. I realized very soon that he was delivering a solemn message, for there was a solemnity in the congregation that was almost oppressive. He spoke quietly, but all could hear him, and I felt that his life was in the word. He once told me that he had to give himself if he wanted to serve God and help men, that it was not enough to give our time and our talents, that our life must be given. This was true, he said, both in praying and in preaching. Alas, how few of us give of our life, and we think that our life is touched, touched, we feel it is time to draw back. How often we have heard it said, you will kill yourself if you work as you do, take it easy. But Hyde used to say, give your life for God and men. Let that vital energy, that living power within, be poured out for men. Who was right, Hyde or the modern man? Hyde gave himself as he preached. He poured out his life as he prayed. That morning in Silica, he did this, and men realized the power. I heard that immediately after the service, the committee was called together to consider God's challenge to them and for prayer that the message might influence men. At breakfast, men were in groups, asking what should be done, and I know that many went away alone to have their lives readjusted by the Holy Spirit. At one of our conventions, he spoke to the Europeans. Most of them were missionaries. He spoke on the cross. I think that the Spirit used him to give us an entirely new vision of the cross. That was one of the most inspiring messages I ever heard. He began the address by saying that from whatever side or direction we look at Christ on the cross, we see wounds, we see signs of suffering. From above, we see the marks of the crown of thorns. From behind the cross, we see the furrows caused by the scourging, etc. And he dwelt on the cross with such illumination that we forgot Hyde and everyone else. The dying yet living Christ was before us. Then step by step we were led to see in the crucified Christ the sufficiency for every need of ours, and as he dwelt on the fitness of Christ for every emergency, I felt that I had sufficient time for time and eternity. But the climax of all to me was the way he emphasized the truth that Christ on the cross cried out triumphantly, It is finished. When all around thought that his life had ended, it seemed to his disciples that he had failed to carry out his purposes. It appeared to his enemies that at last their dangerous enemy had been overcome. To all appearances, the struggle was over and his life had come to a tragic end. When the triumphant cry of victory was sounded out, it is finished, a cry of triumph in the darkest hour. And Hyde showed us that if united to Christ, we can also shout triumphantly, even when everything points to despair. Though our work may appear to have failed, and the enemy to have gained the ascendancy, and we are blamed by all our friends and pitied by all our fellow workers, even then we can take our stand with Christ on the cross and shout out, Victory, victory, victory. From that day, I have never been in despair about our work. Whenever I feel despondent, I think I hear Hyde's voice shouting, Victory, and that immediately takes my thought to Calvary, and I hear my Savior in his dying hour crying out with joy, It is finished. As Hyde said, this is real victory, to shout triumphantly, though all around is darkness. I remember that the Honorable M. Waldegrave, the late Lord Radstock's son, was in the service, and in leaving at the close, he said to me, 
I generally go to my tent after every service and write the message that I have heard to my wife, but Mr. Hyde's message just delivered seems so sacred and appealing that I dare not try to write it. I had a long talk with Hyde afterwards about the cross and the message, and he told me that for a whole year he had been fascinated by the cross. I cannot speak on any, any other subject now, he said. I heard him speak on the cross at another convention some weeks afterwards, and that was accompanied by the Holy Spirit's power in a similar way. How the Spirit of Dissension Was Quenched at Silicot At the first convention that I attended at Silicot, the evil one made a desperate attempt to destroy the whole work. At the previous convention, some terrible confessions had been made both by missionaries and Indian workers, and at the convention that I attended, sins were revealed that shocked all persons present. Some few that attended were exceedingly annoyed and wanted the committee to consider the question and decide either that there should be no public confession, or else that men and women should be separated and men should confess at the men's meetings and women at the women's meetings. These people wanted the committee to meet to meet them to discuss the whole matter. The reply of the committee was, let us meet together to pray over the matter. These men would not and said that it was useless to pray until the question had been decided. As I was an outsider, I heard the arguments on both sides. I did not like to hear open confession of the sins of immorality, but I deplored the spirit manifested by some of the people who were against confessions. One young fellow thumping the table said, I'll smash the whole convention. I had a quiet talk on the subject with Hyde. He was one of the committee and manifested such a tender, loving spirit and was so sane through it all that I was greatly impressed. He said that the committee had never called for confessions, that it was the Spirit of God that had moved men to confess. He said that he felt that legislation on the question setting apart special meetings for confessions would be like taking the matter out of, out of the Holy Spirit's hand and it would in one way give sanction to open confession. I well remember how earnestly he said that the sin of immorality was more prevalent among the Christians than anyone dreamt, and that the Holy Spirit saw that extreme measures were needed to get men to realize this sin. Some men, I fear, said Hyde, are guilty, and are afraid that the Holy Spirit will compel them to, con compel them to confess. How tenderly he spoke of these men, how confident he was that the Lord at the right moment would reveal clearly his will in the matter. It was one of the darkest hours of the Silica Convention, and yet Hyde's face was full of joy, for he knew that victory was assured. Victory came. Those who opposed confession went together to the prayer room, hoping to, to discuss the question. Hyde was praying, several others of the committee were praying, and they gave such a hearty welcome to those men to pray with them that they did so, and after some time, McChain Patterson one of the members of the committee spoke and spoke with such power that the discussion dropped. He showed that no member of the committee had ever urged public confession. All that the committee desired was implicit obedience to the Holy Spirit. These men said that they too desired that all men should obey the Spirit, and then someone began to praise God, and all joined in singing. And the prayer room once more became a praise room. I realized then, in a new way, how much better it would be to settle our differences by meeting together to pray, by allowing the Holy Spirit to have his way with us. Since then, I have put this matter more than once to the test. When at committee meetings or conference disputes arose and feelings ran high, when men began to get excited and fight for their own opinions, the best way to meet all this was to keep quiet in a corner praying that the Holy Spirit might come and reveal His will and direct men's thoughts in the right path. How wonderfully He has led us out of the mazes and brought peace and happiness to men's minds. This was High's way of meeting difficulties, and this was the way of the Master. Shall this be our way? Whatever may be the trouble, let us put ourselves in a right attitude toward God and wait for the Holy Spirit to work in us to do what is right. Resting time in Wales. I left for Wales in December 1910. I saw Mr. Hyde the previous October and knew that he was intended taking his furlough early in 1911. 
I asked him to take a run across to see me when passing through England, and he replied, as he generally did, that he would call if the Lord would open the way. I gave him my address, but he lost it. The day before his steamer was due to arrive in Liverpool, he asked the CMS missionary who was on board whether he had any idea what part of Wales I came from. I had only a casual acquaintance with this missionary and had never seen his wife, but he immediately told her that his wife had my address, and he went down to her cabin and brought it up. To this day, I have no idea where she obtained my address. The steamer arrived in Liverpool on Good Friday, and he crossed over to Birkenhead to get a train for my, my home, Lanagalen. When he reached the station, he was told that only one train ran on Good Friday, and that had gone. Someone overheard the question and answer and told him that there was a cheap excursion train going direct to the place and told him to book an excursion ticket, which he did. But when he reached the train, he was told he could take no luggage with him, and he had all his belongings in a big American trunk. He waited a moment and prayed, I am sure, when the guard came to him and said, Go and secure your seat and leave your trunk with me. I shall bring it in my van. And he did so. All these incidents I have mentioned were clear indications to him that he was in the line of God's will. He lived so near the Lord that he was sensitive to the slightest promptings of his will, and he seemed to know at once when the Lord was not with him. How everything fitted together because... All was under the direct control of God for the good of his servant. But this was not all. It had been arranged by the mission that I should be on deputation work for some time in Carnivorshire just those days. But at the last moment, the tour was canceled because the people were too busy in arranging for the installation of the Prince of Wales as Prince of Car Carnivon for arrangements to be made for missionary meetings and so I had a fortnight's rest in my old home, and I wondered what was behind all this. I was glad of the quiet time, but I felt there was some other reason. On Good Friday morning, I went round the little town just as I used to go when I was a boy, and told my wife that I would be back in less than an hour. But when I arrived back, my wife rushed to the door and said, Guess who has come? Of all your numerous friends, which one would you like to see and have his company on Good Friday? I could not mention one, but I felt that there was some joy in store for me, and I saw that my wife was greatly excited, for she had longed for years to meet Hyde. Then she said, go to the bedroom and see who was having a wash. I rushed upstairs, and there was Hyde, with his face beaming with joy, and that was the beginning of a month or two of a little heaven on earth for me. It was not difficult for me to persuade him to make his home with me for some weeks, a dearly beloved doctor and his wife who lived near begged that they should entertain him, and as I knew that he would be far more comfortable there than in, in the little house where we stayed, and I knew that he needed the care of a doctor, we gladly allowed them to have him there to sleep, and he came for most of his meals to us. What a time that was! He and my wife seemed to understand each other from the very first hour, and no brother and sister in the Lord ever loved each other, and understood each other better than, than they did. What time we spent around that little table where we had our meals. The fellowship was so sweet, the blessing asked for before the meal commenced, often turned into a lengthy prayer, and the food became cold, but our hearts were warmed up, and every morsel we ate seemed to be tasty and to have an additional relish. What a privilege it is to have one of the children of God who lives in his very presence with us at the table. It became the Lord's banqueting house, and we freely drank of his spirit. What would I not give to have one of those days back again? Will my readers forgive me for dwelling so long on this? I had such a blessing, I can never forget it. We, we went round to visit some of the old saints, and among others, we called on a dear aged child of God who was very deaf. Mr. Hyde himself was deaf. This dear old lady shouted to him that she missed the services very much, for I cannot hear anything when I go, she said, and to her surprise, he said, you ought to pray, praise God for that. She thought that he had misunderstood her, and she said again, I cannot hear, I tell you. And he answered, that is why I tell you that you should praise the Lord. Then he explained to her what he meant. He said that it was rarely that he could hear anything when he went to the services, but that it was a fine opportunity to pray, 
Everything was so quiet and the whole environment seemed to help him to pray and worship. He said that he looked at the preacher and prayed for him, then at the different people, and prayed for them as he looked at them, until he began to praise God for being deaf, and it gave him such a glorious opportunity for prayer and adoration. The dear old lady laughed heartily and entered into the spirit of his remarks, and said quite cheerfully, I think I should try that way too. And some two or three years afterwards, she wrote to me and said that she praised God for what Hyde had said, and that it had made a wonderful difference in her life. She has gone home, and no doubt they have been drawn together on the other side and praised God together for all the ways that he led them. What walks we had together on the mountainside, and we would sit down together on one of the rustic seats provided for visitors and have a time of prayer together, or throw ourselves down under some of those shady trees and have fellowship with the Master. How one longs for him. It was during some of these walks that he gave me some of the, his early history, he spoke a great deal about his mother and what an earnest Christian she was and what careful training she had given him. He often spoke of her singing, and over and over again he said that she was the best singer he had ever heard and such a holy woman. I felt at the time that he just longed to go home to her. When he was staying with me, he often spoke of Keswick, and his one desire then was to remain in England over Keswick week. He wanted to attend the convention and to have McShane Patterson with him there, and he was giving me the privilege of being with them so as to make it a trio, and we were to have a prayer room in Keswick during the convention and to continue in prayer day and night. However, both he and McShane Patterson were ill during the convention and failed to attend. The Lord allowed me to go there, but we did not have the prayer room, though I did suggest it. I often think what would have been the result if they had come there. Mr. Walker of Tinvalley was present, and he would certainly have joined us. To this day, the prayer room has not had its place at Keswick, but there has been so much prayer for this that it may yet come, and then Keswick will be as near perfection as we can imagine any holy gathering this side of paradise. Victory Over the Powers of Darkness One of the red-letter days of my friendship with Hyde was in connection with one of the missions which Chapman and Alexander conducted in one of the towns in western England. Mr. Hyde was staying with us in my home, and we happened to be without deputation work for some days, and we heard that a mission was to be conducted by Mr. Chapman and Alexander, and I suggested that we should attend this mission for three days. We engaged small rooms in a quiet hotel, the first afternoon, we had two of the Lord's children with us, a man and a wife, who had been greatly blessed by the 1904 to 1905 arrival, and Mr. Hyde's company was made a great blessing to them. Mr. Hyde had never met Mr. Chapman, but as they both belonged to the same church, Mr. Hyde was anxious to meet him. We reached the town, Shrewsbury, about midday on a Thursday. The first service was to be held at two o'clock. After a little food, we made our way toward the service so as to secure a good seat, and we expected a great throng. It was some little disappointment to me personally to find the street comparatively empty. When in sight of the hall, we saw Mr. Chapman and party coming, and we waited for them, and Mr. Hyde immediately went and introduced himself to Mr. Chapman. Possibly Mr. Chapman had heard his name as a missionary of his own church, but little did he guess the help that this missionary was to render him in his mission and his life. Very few people were in the hall, but a few more came by about two o'clock. There was nothing very remarkable in this service. It was good, and I enjoyed it, and we were all so disappointed at the congregation that we all felt more or less depressed. I met one of the ministers and expressed my disappointment, and he said that such missions were not popular in their town, and evidently he was very well satisfied. At night we had a larger congregation, but there was no enthusiasm. We thoroughly enjoyed the service, but were surprised by the lack of zeal and response at the meeting. It was very evident that Mr. Chapman and the others who were helping him were also disappointed. Hyde said very little. That night one of the leading elders of one of the churches, an old friend of mine, joined us at supper, and he was surprised that we had come all the way to attend a mission. He had heard of it but had not attended the meetings. We persuaded him to interest himself in the work, and he promised to attend if he could. 
It was suggested it was suggested by Mr. Chapman that the ministers and leaders should meet together the next day for a quiet talk and prayer to see whether anything could be done to rouse the people to attend the services. Mr. Hyde and myself were asked to be present, and it was at this meeting that we realized the great need of prayer. The ministers present, and they were a good number, seemed to treat the whole mission as some little sideshow. Mr. Chapman's address was intense, but the remarks made by some of the ministers revealed a state of appalling indifference that even Dr. Chapman, with a sad countenance, said that if that was the spirit in which the leaders faced the mission, then he had nothing more to say and asked the people to excuse him and went out. That, to some extent, sobered the most frivolous, and the few earnest souls had their way. I noticed Hyde's head getting lower and lower, and his face wore that burdened look he always had when the burden of prayer was coming on him. He spoke but little to anyone that night, and the next afternoon we had to leave, for we both had preaching engagements on the Sunday. But he came to me and asked me to engage his room for him for the following week, that he intended coming back on Monday morning. I cannot leave a brother minister to bear this burden alone, he said. I secured the room for him. He spoke with power at two or three services on the Sunday and returned by train early on Monday. Knowing the weak state of his health and fearing lest the burden be too much for him, I wrote, unknown to Hyde, a line to Dr. Chapman, asking him, if possible, to arrange for someone to be with Hyde so as to help him in his work of intercession. Mr. Chapman was kindly arranged for a worthy, sympathetic helper in the person of Mr. Davis of the Pocket Testament League, and the two being kindred spirits became very friendly. What was the result of this intercession? Let Mr. Chapman's letter tell. At one of our missions in England, the audience was extremely small. Results seemed impossible, but I received a letter from a missionary that an American missionary known as Praying Hyde would be in the place to pray God's blessing down upon our work. Almost instantly, the tide changed, the hall was packed, and my first invitation meant 50 men for Jesus Christ. As we were leaving, I said, Mr. Hyde, I want you to pray for me. He came to my room, turned the key in the door, dropped on his knees, waited five minutes without a single syllable coming from his lips. I could hear my own heart thumping and his beating. I felt the hot tears running down my face. I knew I was with God. Then with upturned face, down which tears streamed, he said, Oh, God. Then for five minutes, he was still again. And then when he knew he was talking to God, his arm went round my shoulder. Then he came up from the depth of his heart, such petitions for men as I had never heard before, and I rose from my knees to know what real prayer was. We have gone around the world and back again, believing that prayer is mighty, and we believe it as never before. Mr. Hyde remained in the place for a whole week and then crawled back to us. I saw at once that he had been wrestling with the Lord and had gained the victory, but it had almost been too much for his physical strength. The following day, he could scarcely speak, he was so weak, but he smiled and whispered to me as I bent over him. The burden was very heavy, but my dear Savior's burden for me took him down to the grave. From other sources we heard what a great success the mission had been, how the churches were revived and many were brought to the light. I was especially glad to hear of a stirring address given at a presbytery a few weeks afterward by the very elder who had joined us at supper and was scarcely interested enough to attend the mission, but he did attend and was gloriously blessed, and his account of the mission and the blessing which accompanied it stirred the whole presbytery. How much had Hyde's prayer to do with this? Thinking over Hyde's share in the work, I could not help comparing his devotion and my lack of responsibility. He realized the need in a way that I did not, he was willing to sacrifice everything so that Christ's name should be honored in that town. How willing he was to work out of sight. He never thought of himself. He just saw the town, the condition of the churches, the indifference of the ministers, as Christ himself saw those things. And instead of criticizing and blaming the men, he took their burden and carried it to the Lord. Not one word of criticism did I hear, not one word of what he had done, but he did speak of the glory of Christ manifested, 
of the powerful messages delivered by Mr. Chapman and Alexander, and especially of the power of intercession, which his companion, Mr. Davies, had received, or for the absence of self in me, for the power of prayer and the Spirit's insight to see the need all around. Triumphing Under Testings Two incidents which occurred when Mr. Hyde was in England gave me great pain, but they did not appear to affect him in any way, and to watch him at that time made me realize how very Christ-like he was, and brought home many lessons to me. Hyde and myself were invited to join the Keswick speakers and promoters in the two days prayer meeting at the residence of the late Evan Hopkins. We were glad of the invitation and had two days of very precious fellowship with the Lord and the dear saints assembled about 40 or more. The time was spent in prayer. It was an ideal time of intercession. I could see that the burden of prayer had come upon Hyde, for his countenance proved it. He was in his element with so many experienced intercessors around him, but I saw that he longed that they should be led into a still deeper life of intercession. He did not say so, for criticism was not in his line at all. I do not think that I ever heard him criticizing any persons, though he could vehemently denounced sin. It was by his prayers when we were praying together that I was led to realize this. Toward the middle of the second day, one or two spoke, and there was a kind of discussion over the question of a prayer room for Keswick, and we were asked to state our experience of this in Indian conventions. I stated very briefly my thoughts on the subject. I wanted Hyde to have as much time as possible, for I felt that he would raise the question to a much higher level than the setting apart of a prayer room where continued prayer could be made. He began and spoke more slowly, if anything, than usual. He happened to be the only one, I happened to be the only one that knew him and knew by his manner that he was heavily burdened with his message. He spoke very quietly for three or four minutes. Then one of the ladies present began to sing a popular hymn and it was taken up by several others and the message was never delivered. Mr. Hyde just closed his eyes and prayed. I was afraid that his feelings would have been hurt, but there was not a word of resentment or even displeasure. How many of us would have borne it as he did? The burden weighed so heavily upon him that he was prostrated and had a violent headache and became so weak that he could not leave with the rest of us that evening. So he stayed on as the guest of Mr. Evan Hopkins, and he told me afterwards that he had such blessed fellowship with him. Not one word did he utter about the meeting having sung him down, but spoke with love and tenderness of all. How many of us would have stood it in the same way? I am happy I would have keenly felt it, even if I had not resented it. But Hyde's constant fellowship with Christ in prayer had made him impervious to such a, even such subtle attacks of the evil one. A similar incident took place at a presbytery in North Wales. Mr. Hyde had been speaking with great power at many of the churches belonging to that presbytery, and many were the invitations that he had to be present at the following presbytery and deliver a message to the ministers and elders. He was not officially asked by the moderator, but the leaders of the church where the presbytery was, was held had pressed him to be present. Being a Presbyterian himself, he told me that he looked forward with joy to the gathering. It was at a great sacrifice that he attended. He had to leave very early in the morning and take a long railway journey so as to be in time. He was suffering, too, at the time from his severe headaches and from the malady which carried him away in less than 12 months. The presbytery was a large one, for it was rumored that Hyde would be present. Word was sent up to the moderator and to the secretary more than once, but the meeting closed without even wel welcoming a brother, Presbyterian minister, who had been a missionary for years in their midst. A visitor is usually welcomed, especially if his name be known, but Mr. Hyde sat throughout the whole meeting. Being deaf, he could not hear, and the proceedings being carried on in Welsh, he would have not understood had he been able to hear. His eyes were closed, and I knew he was praying for all present. When the meeting closed and many rushed up to him to shake hands with him and to express their disappointment that he had not been asked to speak, he smiled on all and spoke quite cheerfully, and when I expressed my sorrow and my indignation to him when we were alone, he gently rebuked me and said that the Lord knew everything, 
and it was not our place to criticize the Lord's people. Scores of times since then have I thought of him when the Lord's children were inclined to act unkindly toward me, or appeared to me to misunderstand my attitude willfully, and had been compelled to check myself and not to criticize them, but to praise the Lord that he knew all, and to pray for the very friends that acted so. How often Mr. Hyde excused men who had been unkind to him. They do not understand, he said. I know they do not want to be unkind. He once replied when he was asked to defend himself against a bitter and unjust attack. A friend even offered to write and explain, but he quietly said, This is my cross, which he wants me to take up and carry for him. What if we all had this spirit? Misunderstandings in mission stations, etc., would cease. How the work in many stations in India is marred and hindered by these trivial misunderstandings. The parties themselves grieve over this and wish it could be removed. How often the work of the Holy Spirit has been hindered and even stopped by petty jealousies, someone feeling that he is not having the position he ought to have, or someone has passed an unkind remark or an uncharitable criticism about someone else. Oh, these petty quarrels, jealousies, and misunderstandings among the dear children of God. How can they be done away with? I think that Hyde's way is sure to succeed. Be much in prayer. Let any slight or even insult be an occasion to pray for the very persons that do these things, and praise God for the privilege of being permitted to bear these things. I think it was it is Madame Guyon that used to say that when she was insulted or persecuted, thank you, Father. You saw I needed just this humbling. But we need a life of prayer to be able to do this, not a spasmodic spurt, but a habit of prayer to live in communion with him. Shall we take this lesson from Hyde? His three outstanding characteristics. Thinking over Mr. Hyde's life as a whole, I find some special features in him which account for his influence over men. Number one, his ardent love for the Savior. I asked Hyde one day how it was that he was not married, that a wife would be able to look after his comforts. He smiled, and after a little time he said, Just to see it, we're betraying a secret. Years ago I felt that I wanted to give something to Jesus Christ who loved me so much, and I gave myself to him absolutely, and promised him that no one should come into my life and share my affection for him. I told the Lord that I would not marry, but be his altogether. What a devotion, and how loyally he kept his promise. Christ was all in all to him. He was constantly talking to him. This accounted for the atmosphere of prayer that Hyde lived in. This love was a gift, and we can have the same gift. Hyde went down lower and lower so that the love of God could be poured into his life. He opened his life for God's love to flow in. Oh, that we could do this, then prayer would naturally flow into our lives also. Number two, arising out of all of this, all knew that he had a passionate love for the people among whom he worked, so that he practically sacrificed everything for them. He lived with them, he ate and slept with them. I repeatedly heard that some took advantage of his kindness and imposed upon him. He knew this, but would say nothing to them even though they stole his goods. He saw men wearing his clothes. He would not call them to account, lest the men should be driven further away from Christ. He so loved men's souls that worldly goods were of no account when his soul was in danger. He was often blamed for this by some of his fellow missionaries, but it had no effect upon him. An Indian doctor in the Punjab told me soon after Mr. Hyde's home call that some time before the Ara Samaj was troubled because of his influence over men and the number of men that were converted under his preaching. The members of the Samaj determined to send a man to find out all about Mr. Hyde's life, to watch his faults, and then they would publish these abroad and so break his influence over the people. One of their number went to Mr. Hyde and pretended that he was an inquirer and wanted to know all about the Christian religion. Mr. Hyde received him kindly and invited him to stay with him. This was just what the man wanted, and he remained with Hyde for three or four days, and then ran away, and went to the men that had sent him and said, He has no fault. The man has no fault. He is a God. He is a God, and not man. 
This was the verdict of a man who lived with him day and night for three or four days. No fault. How many of us would have stood the test? He so loved men and realized it that they could see no fault in him. This again accounted for his prayer life. Hyde must have seen much fault in the men, but to see a fault was only an excuse for prayer for those men. He always found some excuse for those who deceived and robbed him. It was so like the master, they know not what they do. If we loved men more and sacrificed more for them, we would pray more for them. Number three, his genuine regard and affection for his fellow missionaries. And yet he dared to go against their opinions when he felt that the Lord was guiding him in that direction. We have heard some of the members of his own mission say that for years they did not understand him. But once they did, they were the first to acknowledge his power. Some hard things were said to him and of him, but I do not think that anyone ever heard him speak an unkind word to any missionary or of any missionary. He said more than once to me that some of the missionaries did not understand him. Many thought that he was a morose, melancholy person, but he was not, though he looked like that at times. When he was in the company of those that understood him, how bright and cheerful he was. He had what some have called sanctified humor. He was very humorous, but he had it under perfect control, and he seemed to keep the company that he was in in the same spirit. His influence over missionaries the last few years of his life was wonderful. I think that it would not be wrong to say that he created a new era of prayer in the Punjab among some of the old prayer warriors that knew and felt India's needs. They prayed much for the country and loved to be with Mr. Hyde, for he gave them a new conception of prayer. The dear Indian Christians flocked around him, and he always gave them some dainty morsel from the word. He was as faithful in leading men to Christ if he thought that men were looking up to him and not to the master. He would run away and remain away in some hiding place praying for them. He being dead yet speaks is true of him. It is now many years since he was called home, but he is not forgotten. He is speaking to us today and throwing light on the prayer life of Christ. Whenever I spend a few days in his company, I always vowed that I would pray more than I had ever done, and Christ always seemed more real to me. It seemed easy to pray, for Jesus had become more precious than ever to me. And if these reminiscences of him would lead us nearer to Christ and give us a new conception of prayer, then they will not have been written in vain. Praying, Preaching, Persuading we do not know of any three words that described him better than the words praying, preaching, persuading. This was the sum and substance of his life, and if we could bring ourselves and get others to make this to be our very life, what a blessing it would be to India and to the world. Praying. Our difficulty is to keep the prayer balance of our work, to keep difficult duties in their right relation to put first things first. We have been told over and over again and we have often told ourselves this, though we may not have said so openly, that duties are so pressing that we have no time to give to prayer as we ought to give. We all acknowledge the importance of prayer, but we excuse ourselves for not giving more time to intercession by saying that duties have been given to us and we must attend to them. And if we, we gave some hours to prayer, it would mean the neglect of those duties. But if we probe down to the real causes, we shall find that it is not so much the duties that press upon us as the fear of men. We wonder what men would think of us and say about us, if we apparently fail to carry on the work entrusted to us or postpone it. It would sometimes lead others into trouble, and they would blame us. But Hyde had learned to put God first and would allow himself to be misunderstood rather than neglect prayer. Sometimes the burden of prayer would be upon him. And during those days, letters would reach him, but Hyde felt that he had to concentrate his whole life on prayer, and to attend to his correspondence would be a distraction. He was not one that willfully neglected his correspondence, but when this interfered with his prayer life, it had to be kept in abeyance. Sometimes he had been announced to speak, but the burden of prayer would come, and he dare not go, so men would be disappointed, and some would be annoyed. He was careful in keeping his engagements. Labor, sleep, money would gladly be sacrificed in order to keep his engagements. 
but nothing would move him when the burden of prayer came upon him. Did we put prayer first? Should we not readjust our lives so that we can give time to prayer? Is not this the great cause of our lack of power? The prophet Isaiah says that the cause of failure is our sin. Your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you, that he will not hear. How true this is. We cannot pray. We cannot be alone with God while we knowingly, willfully harbor sin in our life. The sin must go if we are going to plead with God. One of the Lord's servants, who was filled with the Spirit and with power, told us how he entered into this experience. He realized his need and was miserable, so he determined that he would shut himself in his room and have it out with God. But no sooner had he dropped on his knees than God said, Give up this habit of yours. He felt angry with himself for being so childish and sentimental, but he could not pray and left the room but he felt so miserable that he tried again with the same result, and this went on for some days. At last, in a kind of despair, he told the Lord that he would give up everything, though he did not believe that the, hab that the habit had anything to do with his failure. But if the Lord wanted it removed, he was willing for the Lord to do so, as he could not do it himself, and instantly the whole atmosphere changed, and he had access to the Lord. And every day he was drawn to the secret place. Many other sins during the following days were revealed to him while on his knees, but it was not difficult to part with these sins. Perhaps our sins hinder our prayers. We may be very sure that we cannot keep on long in secret prayer while we nurse secret sins in our lives. But what we wish to emphasize is the fact that prayer must come first, that whatever duty has to be set aside for a time, prayer cannot be. Let us take this lesson from Hyde's life. Our Savior wept over Jerusalem, and this was one reason why Hyde had such influence over men. He followed the example of his master and Paul and wept over men. Could we keep back the tears? Did we realize the terrible condition of men, the cost of their salvation, the sin of rejecting the message? This comes from prayer, getting face to face with Christ, the crucified Christ, and then going straight from the sacred secret sanctuary of his presence to be face to face with the lost world. We would cry out with Jeremiah, Oh, that my head were waters, and my, mine eyes a fountain of tears, that I might weep day and night for those around us. This is the Spirit of Christ that works in us, the Spirit of prayer, of preaching, and of persuading men. Let us yield ourselves anew to the Spirit, and he will work the Spirit into our lives. A Master Fisher for Souls, Pleading with Tears J.N. was a Brahmin attending our mission school. As he grew up, the teaching of Christ attracted him, and he was the faithful scholar of one of our lady missionaries at Sunday school as well. When he left school and was beginning to earn his own living, he was drawn to confess publicly that Christ was his Savior. He did this in the face of the bitterest opposition of a widowed mother and relations. Then they tried a more subtle plan. They began to please him. Their kindness won his heart. He went back home and he was surrounded by young men who led him into drink. It must have been an inherited weakness with him. He fell ill and denied his Lord. But thank God he was miserable and went to see Mr. Hyde, who received him as did the father, his prodigal son. The lad living with Mr. Hyde was one from his evil ways and once again confessed faith in his Savior. But what a trial he was when the drink demon would possess him. Again and again he stole Mr. Hyde's clothes and sold them to satisfy his mad craving. I met Mr. Hyde about that time, and he said to me with a smile, I may not get up to you to the hills this summer. The father evidently desires me to spend my hot weather in the plains, and I have no warm clothes left. He took the spoiling of his goods cheerfully and thought they were a small price to pay in exchange for an immortal soul. He would point out how our Lord bore with Judas and others, and how he never sent any away who were anxious to remain in his company. And so Hyde bore with this demon-possessed youth, 
In his sane moments, the lad realized what a privilege was his to live with such a saint. I was traveling in the train, and a Christian lady ticket collector met me at W. She was full of a wonderful man she had seen. He was speaking to a lad seated in a train going to Lahore. The boy was loud and almost abusive. I am tired of this sort of thing. I am going to my boon companions and shall have a good time, he said. Then the gentleman he was speaking to leaned forward and in a low tone begged him not to go away with him. He got back only a rude answer and she, feeling angry and disgusted, left them. When she came back, she saw the missionary still leaning into the carriage window and she heard him beseeching the lad not to leave him. He was imploring him in Christ's name, and she saw tears flowing down his cheeks as he reasoned with the headstrong lad. Ah, I exclaimed. He knew the value of an immortal soul. In spite of all entreaties, the lad took his own way, but to the very end that missionary was seen in deadly earnest trying to win that soul. She lost sight of the missionary when the down train steamed out. He went sadly to some dear friends in Gujarat alone. Next day she saw the same lad coming back from Lahori. She said to him, you have come back very soon again. He looked up with a pale face. I am going back to him, he replied. I have not been able to sleep all night. I could not forget his tears. And he came back a penitent. That missionary was John Hyde and that lad J.N. I often feel that if souls could say the same of us, that we wept over them, our tears would bring them to a proper frame of mind. Our Lord's whole body shed tears when his sweat became, as it were, great drops of blood falling down upon the ground. Jesus wept, the Jews therefore said, therefore how he loved him. Soul winners, can this be said of each one of us? Grace abounding. Those interested in the case of the Brahmin lad mentioned in the previous memoir will be glad to hear that he afterwards paid me a visit. He seemed much, much chastened, and never before had he been so like his former self. He spoke of his aged mother as one who had to be considered, and the old narrow-minded Brahmin friend accompanied him, said to me in a kind of stage whisper, He will be with you again whenever his mother dies. The lad heard it and smiled up assent with the old love in his eyes. We talked long of John Hyde, whom he referred to as up there, pointing heavenward. And when I besought him once again to give up drink and become a teetotaler, he owned that he had not kept his promise. With God's help, you can. He agreed to that. Praise and pray on. The same lad has visited me a second time, and he had a heart-to-heart -heart talk about Mr. Hyde. He tells me that when he returned miserable from Lahori, after running away from Mr. Hyde, he met me near the mission school in the city, and I told him Mr. Hyde was at our mission house. He went there, and going to his room, found him praying. Mr. Hyde opened his eyes, saw him, and took him into his arms and said, I have just been praying that God would send you back to me, and see, he has answered me. When I asked him how he got to know Mr. Hyde so well, he told me a long story, the gist of which I set down just to show how this man of God used to win hearts for his master. He saw Mr. Hyde at Moga Railway Station, went up to him, mentioned a fellow missionary's name, and said that he had been baptized, but had fallen back. Why do you deny Christ? Mr. Hyde asked. The lad began to make excuses, but Mr. Hyde took, took him with him and went into a third-class waiting shed, and with two other Christians, the three knelt down and prayed with this lad, he, he kneeling among them, even though a crowd gathered, and his relations came and saw him praying with the others. The lad says he does not remember exactly what Mr. Hyde said in prayer, but he prayed for him. Then the train came in, and he said goodbye to the lad, adding, We will meet again in a week's time or so. God will arrange it. All this made such an impression on the boy's heart that he took leave and set out to find Mr. Hyde. He at length heard that he was away inland at a Christian colony holding meetings. A Christian lad, and he set out on foot for it, and after two days' travel arrived tired out. 
they were told that Mr. Hyde was in his room praying. He looked up and seeing the Brahmin lad took him in his arms in good Punjabi style, then finding he was tired out, made him lie down and began to rub and press his swollen feet. The lad objected, but Mr. Hyde insisted upon waiting upon him and ministering to his wants with his own hands. He has told me of this with tears in his eyes, adding, I often see him in my dreams before me as of old. Remember, he is praying for you. I have reminded him. That night, while they were all eating dinner, news came that the Indian pastor was taken suddenly ill, and at the same time his house had caught fire. Mr. Hyde ran with the others to help. While they fought the flames, he went to the pastor and found him crying out in agony, and for fear of death, some unconfessed sin was evidently weighing on his conscience. Mr. Hyde talked and prayed with him, and then said, I think it is God's will that you confess your sin in church before your congregation. The pastor agreed, and he was carried to church on his bed. Lying on it with tears, he declared that he was committed to he had committed a great sin against God in that very church and prayed for forgiveness. Then a great peace fell upon him and all pain and sickness at once left him. Upon this, some 20 members of the church were conscience stricken and confessed their sins, finding pardon and peace. They were joined by the others who had put out the fire and the service lasted for an hour and a half, a great work for God beginning. Afterwards, they all returned to their half-finished dinner. The next day, they left for a hill station where Mr. Hyde had received an urgent call to conduct evangelistic services. They traveled in the third class in the hot weather to the foot of the hills. They had only money for one pony and a coolie between them, so they got on the pony turnabout. One night, the Indian preacher was riding on ahead when suddenly his pony stopped short, trembled in every limb, and advanced toward a great big cat that seemed to fascinate the poor beast with its eyes. Then the preacher felt a big body whiz through the air and land just behind him. The pony, recovering itself, dashed away up, up the road and leaped the ditch at the side in its terror, leaving the baffled tiger standing on the roadside. It must have slunk away, for when Mr. Hyde passed, there was no sign of the animal. When they came near the bungalow, they were met by the preacher in a great panic, along with a number of men who had gone back with sticks to see what had happened to Mr. Hyde. He made them go back to the place where the tiger had made his spring. In the moonlight, they saw the marks of its paws on the dust of the roadside, but the animal had gone. They heard that it had killed people and many bullocks. They remained a week in that hill station and held daily services for Christians too. A real work of grace began there, and this lad too, was convicted of the sin of denying his Lord, and making confession was again received into fellowship. On the return journey, they each had a pony, so they went like beggars and returned like kings. The lad laughed and said yes, and a missionary lent me his own pony to ride back on, because one of the Christian workers had said to me, Why did you come and increase the expenses? And I had burst into tears at this rebuke. Perhaps friends will join me in prayer about this lad also. It is not for nothing that God has sent him back to me, and he is sitting by my side as I write. The Secret of Hyde's Power with God and with Men, Giving Thanks in Everything This is God's command to those who would be full of the Holy Spirit, and no one I have ever known obeyed this command more faithfully than John Hyde was one great source of his joy and therefore of his attractive power. Again and again he would declare that if we would want to know why trials are sent us, let us begin by thanking God for them, and we will doubtless soon see why they have been sent. We had among ourselves a phrase, praising God through shut teeth, that meant praising God in the face of the greatest troubles and darkest hours of life. This we can always do, for we can never doubt that he is our Father in heaven, and so all must be well for us at all times and in all circumstances. He used to tell of a remarkable experience he had. He and his catechist were all itinerating together in his district. They had arrived at a village, and as it was the hot weather, they had to rise early to go out preaching. 
This morning, John awoke with one of his worst headaches. It was so painful that he could not lift his head from his pillow. Yet he could look up to his heavenly father and thank him for the love that had permitted that headache. His evangelist carried his bed out to a shady place and then went away to preach at his express desire. Now in that village, work among the women folk were at a standstill. Some of the men had learned of Christ and confessed him in baptism, but their wives had never come forward. When spoken to, they would always make the excuse that they had never consulted each other and that all of them might be baptized together. These women heard that the Padre Sahib was not well and in a body went to commiserate with him. He spoke to them of the claims of Christ, which they at once admitted. Yes, they believed he had died for them, sinners. John asked them why they had not confessed him before men. They said they had not talked the matter over amongst themselves. He said there was no time like the present, let them do so now. To this they agreed, and after some discussion, they all declared that it was plain to them that they ought to be baptized. To the great joy of their husbands and the evangelists, this was done, and John Hyde saw why the headache had been sent. He was enabled to thank God then with understanding. He always declared this experience was a valuable lesson to him and enabled him to thank God for all things at all times. Now this became no mechanical habit on his part, but a deep-rooted principle of his life founded on experience of God's marvelous love. The deeper our sense of that love, the more we will be able to praise and thank him. How John Hyde used to agonize in prayer for believers that they might know the love of God. In this matter, he was strictly in the apostolic succession, a succession for all missionaries, both men and women. Mr. Hyde had a wonderful experience to which he owed, I believe, his power with God and therefore with man. He used to speak of it as one of the most direct and solemn lessons God had ever taught him. He was up in the hills resting for a short time. He had been burdened about the spiritual condition of a certain pastor, and he resolved to spend time in indefinite intercession for him. Entering into his inner chamber, he began pouring out his heart to his heavenly Father concerning that brother somewhat as follows. O oh God, you know that brother, how cold he was going to say, when suddenly a hand seemed to be laid on his lips, and a voice said to him in stern reproach, He that touches him touches the apple of my eye. A great horror came over him. He had been guilty before God of accusing the brethren. He had been judging his brother. He felt rebuked and humbled before God. It was he himself who first needed putting right. He confessed this sin. He claimed the precious blood of Christ that cleanses from all sin. Whatsoever things are lovely, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Then he cried out, Father, show me what things are lovely and of good report in my brother's life. Like a flash, he remembered how that brother had given up all for Christ during much suffering from relations whom he had given up. He was reminded of his years of hard work, of the tact with which he managed his difficult congregation, of the many quarrels he had healed, of what a model husband he was. One thing after another rose up before him, so all his prayer season was spent in praise for his brother instead of in prayer. He could not recall a single petition, nothing but thanksgiving. God was opening his servant's eyes to the highest of ministries, that of praise. Mark the result also on that brother's life. When Mr. Hyde went down to the plains, he found that just then the brother had received a great spiritual uplift. While he was praising, God was blessing. A wonderful divine law, the law of a father's love. While we bless God for any child of his, he delights to bless that one. This was the secret of John Hyde's power with God. He saw the good in God's little ones, and so was able to appreciate God's work of grace in that heart. Hence, he supplied the heavenly atmosphere of praise in which God's love was free to work in all its fullness. This, too, was what gave him power with men. We are attracted to those who appreciate us. All our powers expand in their presence, and we are with them at our best. Hence, they call out all that is good in us, and we feel uplifted when with them.
To such souls we turn as naturally as the flowers to the sun, and our hearts expand and bloom out with a fragrance that surprises even ourselves. Now this is a law that holds good, especially with children, and with those who are yet young in the Christian life. The more mature God's people are, the less they depend on man's approbation or censure, but not so when they are children. Remember, too, our Lord's solemn warning against casting a stumbling block in the way of any of his little ones. When we look at their faults, we shrivel up their energies. They are at their worst. In a word, we encourage their faults by thinking about them. Let us remember, above all else, that God's people on this earth are in the making. This is his workshop, and souls are being fashioned and formed in it. The final polishing touches we will not receive in the present life, but when this body of humiliation has been transformed. Suppose you go into a carpenter's shop and begin to find fault with his unfinished chairs and tables. You say, how rough this is. What an ugly corner that is. The carpenter will doubtless get angry and say, bear in mind that I am still making these things. They are yet not yet finished. Come and see the pattern after which they are being fashioned. See, this is what they will yet be like when I have done with them. He shows you beautiful chairs and tables, shining, perfectly formed, polished to perfection. Is the carpenter not right? Is the critic not in the wrong? The one looks at the things that are lovely and eternal, the other at those which are lovely and, thank God, fleeting. Would you have power with God and man for the upbuilding of the Indian church, of any church? Follow the method of the carpenter of Nazareth, who never broke a bruised reed, who never quenched the smoking wick, no matter how much smoke it was giving out. He turned his eyes to the light of God, there burning dimly, and by doing so blew it into a flame till erring disciples became the light of the world. This is the way of love and of eternal hope. The other is the way of sense and of present fact and failure all of which are fleeting, none of which is the eternal truth in eternal love. I never met any man whose very presence seemed to help the weak to become strong, the sinful to repent, the erring to walk aright so much as John Hyde. The secret of his success in building up the people of God lay in this method of looking for all the good in men and making it so to expand that the evil was driven out for want of room. Then should we shut our eyes to the faults of all? Should we never reprove sin? Turn to our Lord. Did he not do so at times? Yes, to the impenitent, to those who opposed him and who would not come to him for help. Just because he was in the habit of looking at all that was good, for that very reason, he was able to reprove with all the greater power. No one can do so more severely than our Lord, just because he loved much, and sympathize so much with all that was good in men. One cause of his success. It will be a comfort to many when they hear that Mr. John Hyde was not naturally a bright and happy man. On the contrary, he was in, him, in himself inclined to be morose, retiring, shy, and silent. Yet he became one of the most joyous souls I have ever met. He was very fond of Isaiah 61, verse 3, where that wonderful exchange is effected by our Lord. He will give us his own beauty, his own oil of joy, and his own garment of praise. If we hand over to him our ashes, what is our past life but ashes, our mourning and our spirit of heaviness. So he received our Lord's doubled gift of joy, John chapter 15, verse 11, freely from his master's hand, and then would burst out into joyful praise. For no one can be filled with the divine joy and not sing his praise. As we joy in God, we soar up into his immediate presence, and it is only in song that our joy finds vent. As well expect the soaring lark to keep silent, as expect the joyous saint not to sing God's praise. In this matter of praise, Mr. Hyde used to tell how a little child shall lead them. He was taught again and again that joyful praise is the divine method for catching men alive. One day he was in a country car traveling to a distant village. His faithful Punjabi evangelist was with him, 
one who was transformed through contact with John Hyde. Two of the evangelist's little children were in the cart. The elders were speaking sadly about the village, how long the gospel had been preached there, and how little interest had been aroused among its people. The children had no such sad thoughts. They were so happy that they sang and went on singing psalms and hymns one after the other. This was infectious, and the two men were constrained to join them. And they, too, were so carried away with the spirit of praise that they all continued singing till they came to that village. Imagine their amazement when they found the people full of real interest and zealous to confess Christ and follow him. Before they left, over a dozen showed such a living faith in their Lord and Savior that Mr. Hyde felt he dared not refuse them baptism then and there. Thus was the first gospel triumph in that village heralded and brought about. He was confident by the spirit of praise which the children had evinced. Another time they had a more marked experience. He, with a party of his evangelists, was in camp in a certain village where the work had been carried on for thirty years. The farm servants had for years been putting off the question of deciding for Christ. They were now in the habit of saying, not now during the harvest, but afterward when it is over. So alas, every year it ended with, the harvest is past, the summer ended, and we are not saved. Jeremiah 8 verse 20. This mission party was so disheartened by their previous experiences that on this occasion they had made up their minds to leave early next morning. That night someone suggested they should all go into the village and sing the gospel in it. This they did, and they were so carried away that they sang on and on till after midnight. Next morning they were preparing to leave when a young man came running from the village. He begged them not to go away, for the council had been called and was meeting even now. No one had gone to work that morning. They were considering whether they should not at once decide for Christ and confess him before all men. They gladly waited, and present, presently the same young man came running back with the welcome news that they had all decided to serve Christ. Mr. Hyde found some fifteen men, mostly the heads of families, quite prepared for baptism, and with an overflowing heart he baptized them before all. After the service, that same young man who had brought the message, a new convert, said to Mr. Hyde, This is the result of your singing last night. Do you remember how we sang, Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and let the King of glory enter in? He has not, has he not entered in this morning? No one had noticed till then the connection between the song of triumph of the night before and the reality of that triumph of the next morning until they learned it from the, this babe in Christ. Yes, verily, out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, you have perfected praise. In fact, Mr. Hyde used to say that at any time when he noticed few souls being led to him, being led by him to Christ, he invariably found it was all due to his lack of the spirit of praise. He would then confess his sin, ask pardon, and take the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. His experience then invariably was that Christ would again draw souls to himself through him. Now was the reason now the reason for this is plain. No fisher can possibly throw his line lightly when he is dull and sad. It is only the bright and joyous soul that can win souls to Christ. Notice how St. Paul connects these two in Philippians four. He is speaking of his fellow laborers or fellow fishers and their success in the work. Then he goes on as if to give the reason for this success and how it may be continued. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say unto you, rejoice. A second cause of his success. This was his wonderful love for souls. It overpowered all else, making him forget everything but that soul with whom God had brought him into contact. He would go on past his railway station as far as the man with whom he was in touch, who was traveling, in order to talk to him the words of life. This was irritating at times, especially once when he almost ordered to attend an important business meeting of his mission. He met an Indian in the train when traveling to that same meeting fell into conversation with him about Christ, and continued the train journey with him that he might tell him more of the Savior of the world. This made him late for that meeting, no doubt to the annoyance 
of even his best friends, but John Hyde's mind was at peace. He had brought up his opportunity, paying a heavy price for it, perhaps, and had faithfully held Christ up to his soul that had need of him. That was sufficient motive and reward for John Hyde. It must be said his mission at last saw his gifts and the special work to which he seemed more and more drawn as he grew older and set him free for it. One of his old evangelists who shared his village mud house with John Hyde for some time once told me with tears of regret in his eyes of his great love for souls. He said Mr. Hyde was always giving away his, clo his clothing, anything he had, to those who came to see him about the things of God. If by any means I may win some, seems to have been his life's aim. One cold winter night, Mr. Hyde tapped at the door of this evangelist's room. It was late and he did not want to open. So Mr. Hyde called out his name and said, Can you lend me a sheet for the night? Where are your own blankets? was the angry retort through the still closed door. Oh yes, that drunken sot that was with you has gone off with them. He will sell them, get drunk, and make a beast of himself. Do you know that you put us all about by doing things like this and then shivering yourself in the cold? He owned with remorse how impertinent he had been, and the tears came to his big black eyes as he asked me if I could imagine all the answer Mr. Hyde gave him. He called him by his name and says, Ah, if the prodigal had come back to you, you would have taken a stick to him. The same evangelist told of another experience. It was in the days when souls were being gathered in. They were at times assured how many would be granted them. That morning after prayer, it was ten souls. They then set out away among the Punjab villages in a country cart. The road lay along a river bank, dangerous at night. They reached that village. They sang, they preached, then sang again and preached. The day wore on, not a sign of even one soul being interested. They became hungry and thirsty. No man gave unto them. Then the two Indian evangelists became impatient to get home to food and rest. But John Hyde would not move. He was waiting for those ten. At last, near the common cottage, they asked for a drink. The man offered them milk and water. They went into his humble house and were refreshed. Then, as they talked, he showed most intelligent knowledge of Jesus Christ. Yes, he had entertained them in his name. Would the family not allow Jesus to enter and take possession of their home? Their father replied they had been thinking of this. Then why not now? He agreed and called his wife and children. They certainly realized what they were doing. And there and then they made up their minds to take their stand at once on the Lord's side. One can picture how tenderly John Hyde received them into God's family in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Yes, all were baptized, nine altogether. It was now getting dark. The short, cold winter day was wearing to an end rapidly. Now at any rate they could depart, so thought the two evangelists, before the darkness made the return journey dangerous. The father began to urge it too. Unwillingly, John Hyde left that home. The cart was sent for by one. The other hastened John Hyde's steps toward it. When it came, they tried to get him to climb in, but no, his eyes were fixed pleadingly on this evangelist. What about that one? he asked longingly. Surely that cry from a true shepherd's heart found a response. He hardened his face and said something about their wives and children being anxious for them at home. But John Hyde stood there waiting, waiting for that tenth soul. He knew that the good shepherd was himself searching for that one still outside the fold. The two evangelists told me afterwards with shame how they urged John Hyde to come away from that village and how the same cry always broke from his lips. What about that one? By and by, the father of the family came up wondering about this delay. Why had the Padre Sahib waited so long? John Hyde told him about the one sheep still wanting. Why, there he is, cried the father, my nephew, whom I have adopted. He has been living with the rest of us, but has been play out playing. He brought the lad forward, a bright, intelligent boy. Mr. Hyde asked him of his faith. The boy answered very clearly and intelligently. There could be no doubt about him. So he, too, was brought into the fold. That is the ten, said John Hyde with a weary sigh, 
of heart's ease as he climbed up to his seat. They were kept safe along that dangerous road in the darkness and arrived home tired but content. That is the rest of Saul our Lord Jesus gives to his faithful, earnest under-shepherds. Yes, and that is the rest of Saul they give him too, for in their passion and longing for the lost, he sees of the travail of his soul and is satisfied. Lord, teach us at whatever cost to satisfy your great heart of love, broken over wandering sheep, so shall we apply balm and healing to that heart. So shall we bind up thy wounds and give thee the joy that was set before thee. May we realize that the angels envy us such service. They cannot render it unto you. Only pardoned sinners can by bringing others into the circle of your pardoning love. Lord, show us that this passion for souls cannot be worked up by any efforts of our own. It comes forth from your bleeding heart, O thou Lamb upon the throne who are still giving forth your glorified life for us. He ever lives to make intercession for us. We praise thee, O Lamb of God, that you have made known thy Father's name and will make it known, that the love wherewith you, O Father, loves me, be in them and I in them. His Childlike Obedience not a day did I pass in John Hyde's company, but his simple obedience surprised me and led me to see what a real son he was. How much his heavenly father's will guided his life. Let me mention one such instance. Once at the Silicon Convention, which was so inspired by his prayers in those old days, the committee, in order to lay stress on the message instead of on the messengers, did not announce the names of the speakers. John Hyde was suddenly asked to speak at the evening meeting. Somehow it got noised abroad and many were saying Mr. Hyde will speak tonight. The meeting was very full and expectant, especially as a great friend of his was in the chair in place of the usual chairman. Just before the speaker's prayer meeting, this friend was asked what psalm should be sung. The subject of our Lord's suffering being much on his heart, he suggested that this 22nd Psalm. Imagine his surprise when the leader of song announced that they would sing the 22nd Psalm at Mr. Hyde's request. It was supposed they had talked it over together. There was much prayer, the praise was fervent, but Mr. Hyde was sitting down on the platform behind the pulpit in deep in prayer. As he did not move, the chairman read Zechariah 13, commenting at some length on that question and answer, What are those wounds between your hands? Then he shall answer, those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. He spoke of the loneliness of Christ in his sufferings, knowing no, no one knowing about his sorrows, and pointed out that only three disciples even entered Gethsemane with our Lord. The other eight were left outside. Those three, alas, were full of sleep, so much so that Peter, referring to this with a certain guilty conscience, speaks of himself as only a witness of the sufferings of Christ who am also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed, who was not yet a partaker in these sufferings. So is it today. The majority of Christians know nothing of Gethsemane. At the best, a few are witnesses only of his sufferings. Hence the world is not one for Christ, nor will it be until his people as a whole become fellow partakers of his sufferings. All this time, John Hyde was lost in prayer. After this, the chairman... The chairman, during another singing, laid his hands on his shoulder and said with a friendly squeeze, If God has a message for you to give, will you give it now? As John did not move, the late John Foreman, then chairman of the convention, said to his brother in the chair, Is he going to speak? I have asked him, was the reply. You ask him too if you are led to do it. Presently, as the singing stopped, he said, May I give two messages God has laid on my heart? He did so, and the meeting proceeded to its close, after which there was a very earnest after-meeting and much prayer by those present. During that time, John Hyde went away to the prayer room without addressing a word to the meeting. The people were thus taught to attend to God's message and not to the messenger. Some time afterwards, I asked him about that matter. He told me that he felt full of the subject, the glory of Christ's kingdom. When, however, the chairman laid his hand on his shoulder, 
He seemed as if he pressed John down. This thought was enforced by his words, if you have a message from God. John began to doubt if God wanted him to give this message then, and so, of course, waited on God in prayer and never had his direct leading to speak to that meeting. Only a man very closely in touch with his Heavenly Father would have been quick enough to follow this leading, and only one whose supreme wish was to please God and not his fellow man would have been brave enough to keep silence in the circumstances. A friend, afterwards speaking of the revival, said to me, we ought to have emphasized the lesson of absolute obedience more than we did. I believe it was want of obedience that grieved the Holy Spirit and stopped that revival. I could not but agree with him, at the same time telling him this incident to show that one of the leaders in that revival, at least, could not be accused of the sin of disobedience. Honoring the Holy Spirit All know how loyally John Hyde supported the Silicon Convention. It was really his addresses that led to the great blessing of that first convention of 1904. This convention was attended largely by missionaries, especially those in the vicinity, and it was a time when God met his own people, when self was unveiled, when God called his own to a deeper consecration, when the Holy Spirit convicted of sin and led to many changed lives. In fact, it was there that the heart surrender of the leaders took place, which led to the revival of 1905. Mr. Hyde's addresses on the Holy Spirit were much use of God to this great end. This convention in the summer of 1904 owed much also to the Punjab Prayer Union, begun by a few souls, on which whom the burden of united prayer for revival had been heavily laid. Needless to say, one of the moving spirits of this union was John Hyde. All of its members were greatly inspired by his habits of prayer and by his whole life of intercession. Most particularly, did they value and benefit by his presence at the annual meetings of the Union. His addresses there appealed to many hearts, and the conversation he had with them led to lives of joy and service such as had never been dreamt of before. Who can forget that memorable annual meeting of the Punjab Prayer Union in the spring of 1905? It was a time when all felt the great burden of the Indian Church and her needs of revival so very keenly as to be inexpressible in words. This was mainly due to the teaching of John Hyde and those like him in regard to the fellowship of Christ's sufferings. There was a general breakdown of all hearts when this subject was talked and prayed about. To many, the Lamb of God appeared with them with his wounded hands and side and showed them how his heart was still being made to bleed by his children when they were not fully consecrated to him and when they were not filled to overflowing with his spirit. Little wonder that the convention of 1905 touched so deeply the life of the Punjab church. Here again, John Hyde was the moving spirit of the whole convention. It seemed as if the mantle of his second great spiritual teacher, Dr. Lytle, of the American United Presbyterian Mission, had descended upon him. The burden of Mr. Lytle's later teaching had been that self-support could only be looked on the old apostolic lines, when the baptism of the Holy Spirit and then the constant infilling of the Holy Spirit received its true place in the heart and life of the Christian community, then self-supporting congregations would spring up everywhere as a natural consequence. Mr. Lytle loved to point out that almost all the apostolic congregations, over 40 in number, were self-supporting and also self-propagating simply because they had put first things first and never rested till they had received the baptism and then the infilling of the Holy Spirit for every new service. This was the burden of John Hyde's addresses at the Silica Convention of 1905. What a thrilling message he delivered. How plainly he showed that the Holy Spirit was the one true witness to be put first and foremost by all Christians so that they might also give their witness in his strength and by his help. When he addressed pastors, asking, asking them who was first and foremost in their pulpits, they themselves were the divine teacher and guide into all the truth. I don't think there was a single preacher who was not convicted of this sin.
Then he went right through the life of Christ, showing how all the mysterious events of that life were performed by means of the Holy Spirit. Our Lord's birth, his baptism, his preaching, his miracles, his sacrifice, his resurrection. The Holy Spirit was witness of each event. So he alone is the true witness. When John Hyde called upon all to see that this divine witness was depended on to teach all inquiring souls the meaning and the mystery of each event, few hearts were unmoved. And then afterwards, when John Hyde intimated that he had no other message to give, the chairman was led to leave each meeting to the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Surely that was the direct result of this teaching. What else could result but that the divine spirit, given its true place, should move all hearts, break them down, melt them into confession and tears, and so begin the first great revival in the Punjab. In the convention of 1904, missionaries were much blessed. It was then that one leader brought things to a crisis by saying, either we missionaries receive power from on high now, or else let us all take the first steamer home, for we are otherwise unfit for this task. The 1905 convention, our pastors and elders were laid hold of largely through Mr. Hyde's teaching and perfect obedience. In the convention of 1906, the blessing extended to Christians generally and reached outside congregations all over Northern India.